So I'm going to talk today about how we resist metaphors, which is itself an interesting concept. And I'm going to give you a few examples of metaphors to start off with. And I want you to tell me, or you can think to yourself, whether or not you like them, dislike them, embrace them, resist them. So the first one is, this is from Pablo Picasso. Art, wash, art washes away from the soul the dust of everyday life. That's good. That's cool. The next one is from um, Emily Dickinson, famous American poet. Dying is a wild night and a new road. That would be nice. Uh, the next one is from George Orwell. Advertising is the rattling of a stick inside a swill bucket. So that captures something about what some of us might think about advertising. Let's have a few more here. How about immigrants are lazy sponges and parasites? And this is the kind of um, metaphor you sometimes see in various discourse about immigration. Um, here's one. My marriage is a roller coaster ride from some twisted hell. Right. You're laughing because you've lived it? <laughs> <laughs> and how about this other one? I am in a fierce battle against cancer. Is that a metaphor? Is that a good way of thinking about dealing with cancer? And of course, metaphor is not just linguistic. It can be non-verbal, pictorial. So here's an example of the melting earth. This is a, a, a depiction of what climate change is happening and its effect upon on the world. Melting earth on top of an ice cream cone. And here is the depiction of how human beings think. It's a bunch of machinery inside your head. And you may like that. You may think, yes, that's what's inside my head. But some of you may possibly go, look, I'm not a machine. I'm a human being. I don't have gears and things inside of my head. So I don't like this particular metaphor, and I may resist it if it's imposed upon me. And so those are just some examples of some of the things that we see in life metaphorically, we encounter in life, and we have different kinds of reactions to. And I want to talk to you today specifically about this idea of the ways in which people resist metaphors. And I think it's actually quite complex and it has a variety of different aspects to it. So I want to explore some of those. So to begin with, we used to think, because of Aristotle, that people who could create metaphors are geniuses, because metaphor is the mark of genius. So a person who can come up with a good metaphor may have this special capacity intellectually that makes that person a genius. So metaphor is thought to be a good thing. But there are lots of people who resist the very idea of metaphor. And we can call these people who hate metaphors, or they urge us to stay away from metaphors. And as a psychologist, I call this trope phobia. They have a phobia of tropes, right? They don't like them. So I want to give you some examples of people who are disliking metaphors or suspicious of metaphors or warn us away from metaphors. Plato. A cautious man should, above all, be on his guard against likenesses. They are a very slippery sort of thing. And, and Plato was not, he, he was not a fan of metaphor because they're used by two of the most horrible people in the world, poets and politicians. And these are the people you wanted to keep away from your ideal societies because they deceive folks through their use of metaphors. So you got to be careful. Thomas Hobbes in the 17th century was a, a prominent advocate against metaphor. He goes, words used metaphorically, metaphorically were employed to deceive others. And again, the sense that metaphor is, is a matter of deception. And part of what he was talking about was used by a m number of people in parliament back at that time, where parliament actually tried to make a law against the use of metaphor. That's how suspicious people were. In the 20th century, in the 1920s, and the 30s of the Vienna Circle, composed of a variety of philosophers and mathematicians and others, and they were you know, interested in uh, logical positivism. And so they said metaphors are emotive. And that's actually an insult to say that something's emotive. To say that something's poetic, that's also kind of insulting in the context of the Vienna Circle. And it's meaningless. Metaphors are meaningless, especially in the context of trying to ascertain the validity of different kinds of empirical propositions. So 
They were skeptical of that, again, primarily in the context of doing science. I think they agreed that metaphors and poetry are great, but not in the context of doing science, because they were meaningless after all. This reminds me of these two physicist colleagues of mine at, at Santa Cruz who, I didn't know who these people were actually, but I was giving a talk at some place, on a campus. I was talking about metaphors and they were about to come in and use the room afterwards for some class. And these two guys came up to me and they got very upset with me. He said, one guy's, you know, we don't use metaphors because we never beat around the bush. <laughs> and the other guy goes, yeah, we always stick to the point. And I'm going, those are metaphors. And they both went, oh, and they turned around and walked away. I mean, there is a sense that people who are hardcore scientists don't like to be accused of using metaphors because metaphors in the world of poetry, and they want to resist metaphors in any way they can in terms of what they do, although the argument is they do it all the time in their theories and their work and their discourse, and they just aren't willing to acknowledge it. But these are people who resist metaphors as a matter of principle. Donald Davidson famously wrote a paper in 1978, which is still widely talked about, but it's sort of in a, a parallel universe. It, it doesn't have much contact with a lot of contemporary metaphor research, but his argument that metaphors are patently false and do not express meaning. So metaphors only mean what they literally mean, nothing more. And anything else about metaphor is something that has to do with suggestions, innuendos, uh, uh, emotions, but it isn't anything to do with meaning. And this, again, there's plenty of people who are still widely debating this and trying to tease apart this, but this is one idea of how metaphors are not particularly useful. And then Richard Rorty has a complex views on metaphor, actually. Um, and his view is that metaphors lack cognitive significance. And here's a quote from something he wrote about this. He goes, a metaphor is, so to speak, a voice from outside logical space rather than an empirical filling up of a portion of that space or a logical philosophical clarification of the structure of that space. It is a call to change one's language and one's life, which can actually be beneficial, and he agreed with that, but it's not a proposal to how to systematize, again, this logical philosophical space. So he, he did not think that they had much cognitive significance. So he was also suspicious of metaphors to a certain degree. This is a lingua, Anna Wiersbicka, uh, who is interested in coming up with semantic primitives that cut across all languages. And these underlying semantic primitives are completely literal. And she says that metaphors are dangerous and associated with false images drawn from this world. So she's very adamant in her belief, and she's against a lot of contemporary metaphor research as a result. Steven Pinker um, has also written a lot against metaphor, particularly, I think he, he was writing against Lakoff, who he doesn't like. But he said, look, we use metaphors a lot in our language, and even though many of us who think that those metaphors are reflective of how people think, he says no, because people effectively are able to transcend the metaphors implicit in their language, and people not enslaved by their metaphors. Now, enslaved is itself a metaphor, but he thinks that you know, the conceptual metaphor view that we speak and our, our speaking is motivated by underlying conceptual metaphors is a sense of enslavement, which he wants to push against. So he, he argues against metaphor as being an important part to the fundamental nature of, of thought. So to him, thought is these basic semantic primitives in some sense that have nothing to do with metaphor, like causation. Causation is metaphorical. Oh, very much metaphorical, as a lot of researchers know. But anyways, he's also very skeptical of metaphor. And this is from an internet blog I happened to came across. He goes, this guy goes, I hate metaphors because they build a straw man into an otherwise civil discussion. So... Again, another example of people who are very suspicious of metaphors. And then I have to give you one that I was told back in the 1970s when I was in graduate school, and it wasn't by people at my university, but by psychologists who I met from other places. And they gave me an advice. Metaphor is a career killer. So if you embrace metaphor as the topic of your study, you will never have a career. 
You'll never, you, you may possibly get a PhD, but you'll never get a job. You'll never get tenure. You'll never have professional success because it's too hard. It's scientifically intractable. That's exactly what people would argue. They told me, stay away from metaphor. And I resisted. I couldn't help it. I started metaphor anyways. <laughs> but the point is, is that it's interesting here is that we have examples of individuals resisting metaphor. But I also think you can see resistance across broad communities in certain areas of philosophy historically, uh, in, in more contemporary terms, certain areas of cognitive science, that they're suspicious of metaphor, at least in the context of trying to understand the underlying basis of human cognition. They think, okay, that's poetry over there, but that's not really human thought. So they're suspicious. They resist it, and they're open about that. Okay, a different kind of resistance is where you may like metaphors, but you may dismiss particular metaphorical ideas. So in American psychology in the 20th century, there was this debate, which continues to this day, about which is the best metaphor to think about how human minds are all about. And so for the first 50 or so years, because of the behaviorists, they said that the mind is a black box. They will never, will never be able to understand what's inside the mind and the only way we can do science is studying the stimulus that goes in and the responses that go out. And that's where our science should be, the relationships between stimulus and response. But we should never make inferences about what's inside the mind. <coughs> Excuse me. And then in the 1950s, and particularly in the 1960s, with the rise of computing machinery, people started thinking about computer minds as being like computers. And we say, oh, well, there's, there's input spaces and output spaces, and there's processing units, and there's memory where knowledge is stored, and there's computations that do processes upon these representations. And so that has been an extremely useful metaphor for generating a huge amount of research in cognitive science, cognitive psychology for 50 years. And the, the black box people would fight back and say, no, that's still not bit good. So B.F. Skinner in particular was adamant about the black box point of view. And the computer mind people go, oh, mine is computer, we still think that's the way to go. Although I should note here, and this is something people always forget, we think of the mind as a computer, but computers were originally people. There are people who do arithmetic and math. And then when we start building machines that can do these computations that people could do, we call those machines computers. So we forget that kind of twisted little origin. But nowadays, people argue that the correct metaphor is mind as a brain. So a lot of ideas about minds and human cognition are based on brain physiology and neural networks, for example, is an example of, is a case of that. So people argue about which concept is correct and which one should be dismissed. And it's not surprising as a result that people like um, Kuhn in 62 in his wonderful book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, and also in writings he did later, often identified that paradigm shifts in science often are in company a shift in metaphors from one kind of metaphor to another. So these are um, cases where people are debating about the utility of different kinds of metaphors. You must have uh, you might also have a discomfort or resistance to a particular metaphorical phrase. So if I said to you, love is an economic exchange, you may understand what that means, but you may resist it because you have a more poetic, romantic view of love, and you don't want to see love relationships that you may be involved in as just a simple business dealing. So you may resist this idea personally. And we often have preferences, as I just talked about it, really, for alternative metaphorical concepts. And I'm going to talk a bit about this in a second. But, for example, in the world of illness, and particularly in the world of cancer, a lot of physicians talk about treating cancer as if you're fighting a war against cancer. And patients do not like that often. They want to think of their cancer treatment and their possible recovery from it as a kind of journey. So they resist one metaphor and they openly try to embrace another one and, and gain it for themselves and make it their own. So they have a preference for an alternative metaphorical idea. Now, metaphor resistance can be partial. So take, for example, the notion of love as a journey. 
And like all metaphors, it has certain aspects of the mapping of journeys onto love, which are positive, which you might like, but there are also aspects that are negative, which you may not like. So, for example, there's positive in this metaphor, like love can surmount obstacles and get better over time along the way. That's a positive aspect of the love as a journey. But there's some negative aspects, namely that there's a lot of changes, there's a lot of interruptions in love journeys, which make them sometimes unpleasant. So for a particular metaphor, you may like some of the entailments and prefer those, but you may resist some of the others for a particular metaphor. So our metaphor resistance can be partial in some cases. Um, this is a, a, a thought that you see a lot, um, and this that we should re resist cliched metaphors, conventional metaphors, because they reflect cliched thinking or language. And this is from a woman, Susan Stebbin, who is actually one of the Vienna Circle. She's one of the few people who are members of the Vienna, few women of the Vienna Circle. And she wrote this really interesting stuff where she used a metaphor to describe the distinction between fresh meat or fresh novel metaphors versus the cliched conventional metaphors where she described as potted meat, like the kind of meat that you find in cans. And she says, potted meat, namely these kind of cliched metaphors, is sometime a convenient form of food. It may be nasty, it contains some uh, nourishment, but its nutritive value is not equivalent to that of fresh meat from which it, is, which it was potted. Also, it must originally been made from fresh meat and must now not, not be allowed to grow and stale. Similarly, a potted belief, like a cliched belief, cliched metaphor, is convenient it can be stated briefly, sometimes in a snappy manner, also so likely to attract attention. So she's using metaphor to talk about how certain metaphors should be avoided, these cliches. And so she's a person who, again, thinks that conventional metaphors lack nutritive value. And as a result, we really should study and focus on novel creative metaphors. And so you see this belief today in the metaphor scholarship world, where there are people who go, Look, conventional metaphors, cliched metaphors, those are just dead. They have no value. They're not nourishing anybody. We should avoid them in our speech, and we should not study them because they're not really metaphors. And therefore, we should study the creative ones, such as Juliet as the Sun, which is by far and away the most studied, the most written about metaphor in the history of humankind. And then Man is Wolf, which is Max Black's famous metaphor. Those are the ones that we should be looking at. Now, it turns out that, again, people who resist these kind of conventional dead metaphors like kick the bucket, meaning to die, and to blow your stack, meaning to get very angry, they say those are not interesting. And this is where I come in, in part, because I've spent a part of my life to study in these, and I think these are actually not dead at all. They often reflect vitally alive metaphorical kinds of concepts. So take expressions like, in American English, to blow your stack, to hit the ceiling, to flip your lid, to get pissed off, and they all mean to get ang very angry in one form or another. But they're not cliché, they're not dead, because they reflect the still vitally alive idea that anger is heated fluid in the bodily container, and they emerge from this idea. And so when you're using these expressions, and I've done experiments to show this, you're still thinking in active metaphorical ways. So a lot of the resistance to these kind of cliched, conventional metaphors, I think, is greatly, dis greatly in error. But again, people do not like conventional metaphors and resist them. Sir? The stack is usually the, the bodily container, the top goes off, and that's what happens when you blow your stack, the top of it goes up and you flip your lid, you hit the ceiling, is again, put too much pressure in the bodily fluid inside and the, the bodily container blows up. And also that includes why using pissed off works because the bodily pressure and you're pissing off, you don't even want to piss off, see, you're pissing me off. That's the same motivation. Now resisting mixed metaphor, this is something you see teachers and writers often say you should resist mixed metaphors. So when you use metaphor, do not mix it up. 
That is, don't start by calling something a swordfish and end up by calling it an hourglass. Don't switch your metaphors in this way. And um, I love the stuff on mixed metaphors. I have an edited book on this topic, and it's partly because they're, so, they're often so fun. And so let me give you an example of one. This is from a, a, a newspaper article, and someone wrote, as I look at the situation with broad brush, there are a lot of things going south at the same time, said Morris Goldstein, a former International Monetary Fund official and senior fellow at the Institute for International Economics in Washington. Where's the good news coming from? There's no silver bullet out there. So we have these metaphors of looking at something with broad brush, looking at it from a broader perspective. A lot of things going south, where south is thought to be negative, or things are going south, they're going negative. And then where there's no silver bullet out there, meaning there's no magical solution to this economic problem. So we got these different kinds of metaphors in there, and this violates the idea that you shouldn't mix them up. But people find these funny. And moreover, in studies I and others have done, show that people don't have difficulties with these whatsoever. And the reason, I think, is because we are, again, very flexible in the ways that we think about certain topics. We can think about certain things using multiple kinds of metaphors. And so when we mix them up, that's not a problem for us because that's how flexible our cognition is. So to give you an example of some mixed metaphors, love relationships are journeys. They're constructing a building like I need. We're building a good foundation for our marriage. Uh, sometimes love relationships are going sane. Uh, sometimes you're being under the influence of magic. There's a variety of different metaphors we use for, for love relationships. And, there's, and it's, we use different metaphors for different contexts, different situations. And I may define my love relationship to have right now, including and using all of these different metaphors depending upon the context. <clears throat> so there's multiple metaphors for many concepts. And the fact that we flip between them is really not a problem despite the fact that many people resist them. Now, what about resisting your own metaphors? You produce the metaphor and then you end up like, no, I resist this. And let me give you a couple examples of this. This is from a television program from the UK, the BBC. And it's about a, a show about these veterin veterinarians back in the 1930s. And they had this one episode where they tried to help this one racehorse who unfortunately they couldn't save and the horse had to be put down. And the vet was talking to his household secretary and sort of bemoaning the fact that this, he failed to help this horse. And she wanted to encourage him. And she said, well, just get right back into the saddle, which is a common metaphor to get back into action. And she said, oh, poor choice of words. So she knew that her metaphor was not particularly appropriate given the fact that the horse that he was working with just died. So here's another one. I love this case. This is, this is one of my favorite. This is some um, work by the poet Adrian Rich, who was, excuse me, probably one of the most famous feminist poets in the 20th century. And in her first book of poetry in the 1950s, she had a, a poem called The Diamond Cutters. And it was a poem about these gentlemen in African mines who were mining these diamonds. And she talked about the labor involved and how you cut the diamonds and so forth. And the poem is really an allegory for writing poetry, how you write poetry. And so she basically made this kind of argument that you know writing poems is like creating sculptures. Creating poems is like creating sculptures. And it was a great poem. And then 25 years later, she was putting her first book of collected, her best poems over her career. And she included this poem. But in the introduction to this volume, she writes that she had trouble with the informing metaphor of the poem. And particularly, she confessed that it talked about enforced and exploited labor of actual Africans and actual diamond mines. And so she basically dismissed the poem. She said, I'm sorry that I've written this poem, but I'm still including it in my best of my life book, uh, poems book. So she's just rejecting your own metaphor that she created some time ago. Here's a different example. This is a relatively new one uh, I saw last year. 
And this is from a university dean in New York. This is at uh, New York University in some dean of some school where in a faculty meeting with all these faculty, they were trying, uh, talking about how to diversify the faculty, to hire diverse faculty and what are the things that they should do. And she referred to herself as a slaveholder in this discussion. And then the next day she resigned her position out of embarrassment for this metaphor. And in her res resignation letter, she wrote the following. In a misguided effort to draw an analogy to a model of reparations, in order to place blame in myself as dean for the racial and inequalities at our school, I thoughtlessly referred to myself as the slaveholder who should be held responsible. I realized it was wrong the minute I heard myself say it and couldn't believe the word had come out of my mouth. So she's resisting her own metaphor and she put herself, she lost her deanship job as a result of it. She just was, I'm showing you how much I'm resisting this by turning down, my, turning down that position. Now you also resist metaphors that are imposed upon you by others. And again, I mentioned earlier the notion that a lot of physicians in Western context talk about for example, treating cancer is fighting a war. And a lot of people, particularly you know, patients, don't like to think of their bodies as fights of battleground. And so they want to have a different kind of metaphor. And, um, but one of the reasons why they fight against it is this war stuff. And the person who was alerted po folks to this fact that these are warlike was Susan Sontag, who was a cultural critic, who wrote a great book in 1978 about um, uh, illness and metaphors. And in it, she said the following. She said, there is a, quote, fight or a, quote, crusade against cancer. Cancer is, quote, the killer disease. People who have cancer are, quote, unquote, cancer victims. Cancer cells do not simply multiply. They are, quote, unquote, invasive. Cancer cells, quote, unquote, colonize from the original tumor to far sites of the body. Rarely are the body's, quote-unquote, defenses vigorous enough to obliterate a tumor that has established its own blood supply. Patients are bombarded with toxic grays. And she had cancer at the time, and she had it for many years and eventually died because of it. But she resisted all of this kind of militaristic language and militaristic metaphors in talking about what her cancer experience was. Do not impose these upon me. So she was against she came out as saying, I'm against metaphor for this reason, but she's actually really only against certain metaphors. So people, again, as I said earlier, often think that they want to treat cancer as a personal journey, where they're under, which is under the control of the patient. The patient has his own agency. And physicians, under this metaphor, are travel guides rather than authoritarian generals. And they very much like this, they feel they're more in control. But there are even people who resist this, and I like this example. This one gentleman goes, cancer is not a journey. Stop with the meaningless platitudes. Cancer is a kidnapping, a hijacking. You're going along, living your life, and bam, a bag gets thrown over your head, and you are captured, and you don't know what the hell you were where you're going. Or you are at gunpoint, being forced to drive by someone who won't tell you the destination, or how long it will take you, and you're trying not to piss yourself, and you've been thrown out of the side of a desolate highway with no water, no food, and no map. You watch the car disappear into the distance. You might die of thirst. You might die. So this person didn't have journeys as being this thing that you're in control of. This is a negative version of the journeys that you're taking and under the control of the person who's doing it. So there's a lot of specificity in these metaphors that people, again, try to carve out for themselves to, to, to deal with their disease on their own terms. But they resist ones that are imposed on them. This is from an example that I was um, witnessed because I was in a, invited to participate in this symo, a symposium on, <coughs> excuse me, contact improvisational dance which was a wonderful event. And they paired me up with this woman who was this famous improvisational contact, contact improvisational dancer. And I was talking about metaphor and how 
people observe contact improvisation with people doing all these things? And how do we interpret it according to certain kinds of conventional kinds of metaphors? So movements upward are thought to reflect goodness and happiness. Movement down reflect illness and dying. And that we use those things in making sense of what these dance creations are all about. And as I said this, this woman who was kind of dancing around me on stage, it was, it was fabulous. She goes, no, I never feel so free as when I'm crawling on my belly across the dance floor. So to her, down was good. And I like this resistance because she was resisting the metaphors that things that are good are necessarily things that are up. But also, she was resisting the very fact that I, who was not a dancer, was some stupid academic, was telling her what her experience should be like. And I perfectly respected that. I was like, I understand that completely. She wanted to make it for her own. And I can understand feeling free, crawling across the floor in your belly. I, I, I can understand that, even if it goes against the dominant metaphors of things that are up, they're good, and things that are bad are down. So another thing that's interesting is that we can be contradictory in our resistance to some metaphors. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and this is from a study that I was doing um, uh, with some people in Brazil and three-year-old children's understanding of what are called primary metaphors. These are metaphors where there's a positive correlation in experience. And we did these different tasks, but we interviewed these three-year-old kids, both in Brazil and in California. And so one of, the, one of the examples was the notion of important is big. And we asked this three-year-old girl, do you think things that are important are things that are big? And she goes, no. My parents have told me that I'm important even though I'm small. And indeed, we have an expression in English, good things come in small packages. So she thought, I'm important, but I'm very small. So the notion that only big things are important is just wrong. And she said this clearly, is evident she really believed this. But I dare say that in many other aspects of her life, important as big was quite valid. The things that were big, the things that she needed to pay attention to, that could potentially be harmful. So we have contradictory beliefs. Our conscious beliefs about some metaphor may not necessarily reflect everything we really think about a metaphor. And that's something that I think we need to pay attention to so our conscious rebellion against a certain metaphor does not necessarily reflect a total rejection of that metaphor in all aspects of our unconscious thinking and bodily action. So another case of people um, resisting metaphors that are imposed upon them is in the case of the disability community. Who, um, So for example, we have expressions sometimes in English, I've had the craziest day this person is such an emotional cripple. That's such a lame excuse. What are you, blind? And the people who are in dis disabled communities reject these kinds of languages, these kinds of metaphors even, because it's using their disabilities in a negative light. And they think that's just kind of inappropriate. And so as some of them have now written, the use of disability metaphors promotes an ideology of impairment as a negative form of embodiment. These metaphors typically position disability as invariably bad, undesirable, pitiful, painful, and so on. They are therefore, and this is a, an insult, ableist, because they promote discriminatory attitudes towards people with disabilities. And a lot of these disabled uh, critics in, the, in their literature are very critical of metaphor studies to the extent to which they talk about good is up, bad is down. And they will say things that they're critical because of they embrace the normative healthy body and our theories of embodied underpinnings of the metaphorical thought and language. So they resist the notion of goodness is up and they try to get people to, and who are disabled to come up with alternative metaphors to reflect the fact that even though they're not necessarily as up with other people, they can still be just as good. Now here again, I want to suggest that sometimes their resistance is contradictory because those, a lot of these ableist metaphors still apply to them in some ways. Being upward for them is still important compared to being sideward and down. So even if they think that being down is okay, it depends not down all the way is okay. It's not right. 
So again, this is an active form of resistance against certain kinds of metaphors and exactly certain kinds of metaphor theories. All right, this is an interesting one. Resisting political metaphors. You see this a lot in contemporary discussions, actually historical discussions. And this is an example from the 2016 presidential campaign between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. And this was a comment by Donald Trump's son, Donald Trump's junior. And they were talking about immigration. And so to give you the context here, this is a kind of candy called Skittles. It's like M&Ms, these little colored candies with chocolate inside. And so Trump Jr. showed a picture of this bowl of Skittles and made the following kind of analogy metaphor. If I had a bowl of Skittles and I told you that just three would kill you, would you take a handful? That's our Syrian refugee problem. This image says it all. Let's end the politically correct agenda that doesn't put America first. So the idea is, all right, we can let in all these Syrian refugees, but like we can let in all the Skittles, but there might be three in there that are very dangerous that might end up killing you. So we should be very careful about letting all the Skittles in. That's the, you get it? So, so people did not like this metaphor at all, as you can possibly imagine. And the people who create Skittles, who made Skittles go, Skittles are candy, refugees are people, we don't think this is an appropriate analogy. Right? So they resist this metaphor completely, and this is, this is really, this is, this is a great, not a Skittle. This is a you know, migrant child somewhere, very poignant resistance to the metaphor. Real, it's really good. But Trump Jr. came back and said, are liberals just really dumb today and don't understand what an analogy is? No one said that people are literary, literary skills. To me, it was a simple metaphor. So there again, it shows that this is very common. People debate and resist metaphors all the time. So here's a case where there was a lot of resistance and there was resistance to the resistance. Kind of interesting. Okay, another form of resistance you see is what isn't discussed at all which is where we resist metaphors in the context of experiments that we do on people. So we might, for example, do experiments looking at how good certain kinds of metaphors are to persuade us of adopting certain kinds of social policies. And so if you want to persuade people to, that we should do something about immigration and have policies to help them, you might say thing, immigration is a natural disaster. And people may be persuaded to that to some degree, but to the part that they're not dis persuaded, they're actually resisting it. And it's interesting how the literature on persuasion doesn't talk much about the implied resistance to some of these kinds of metaphors when they're looking at the relationship between metaphors and persuasion. A different example is in cases of work that I've done looking at these idioms again, where I've asked people to make judgments about something like blow your stack which is motivated by anger is heated fluid in a bodily container versus a similar kind of metaphor, jump down your throat, which is motivated by a different underlying conceptual metaphor, anger is animal behavior. So I'd give people a context and I'd say, which of these two metaphors are most appropriate in this context? And the, the answer is that they tend to pick the one that's the context is consistent with the conceptual metaphor. But there's a kind of resistance when you're having to make a forced choice. I like one, but I will resist the other. And the resistance is part due to the fact there's a mismatch of the underlying conceptual metaphors. So again, there are these studies that have all these things about people's uh, preference for certain kinds of metaphors, but they don't look at the relationship of how we resist certain kinds of metaphors in certain contexts. And in a similar way, this is a little bit more detailed, I've looked at how people understand an expression like blow your stack compared to when it's seen with like in a literal paraphrase, get very angry. And it turns out that the blow your stack doesn't just simply mean to get very angry. It means to get very angry when the anger is caused by internal pressure, when the anger is expressed unintentionally, and then when the anger is expressed, it's irreversible. You can't put the anger back into the container. And if you have a context, a story context, in which any one of these 
entailments is violated, people take longer to understand below your stack because they don't see it as fitting quite as well. Whereas to get very angry works with all of these because that meaning, that expression has a vague meaning. It can apply to lots of contexts in which one gets very angry. Where below your stack gets, it's, has a specific meaning can only really best be used when all these entailments have been met. So we see people slowing down to understand below your stack in some context where you violate these things, it's a certain kind of resistance because it doesn't quite fit. So this is implied in these, these studies, but isn't actually openly discussed. Finally, we have things like studies, which also, also I've done, looking lawyers are sharks, also sharks. And, you know, do you resist that metaphor? You may understand it, but you, you may like it because you hate lawyers. You may dislike it because your family is full of lawyers and you don't see them as shark, you see them as helpful human beings. So it depends on your stereotype understanding of what lawyers are about. And this is a controversial one. This is a study looking at uh, how people accept metaphorical ideas where the idea is presented as if it is a light bulb, where the idea suddenly came brilliantly, came suddenly and brilliantly to the person. And people read about this idea and how it's described as being like a light bulb. And it turns out people find that the idea to be less useful when it's done by a woman than by a man. Because there's a sense that, that there's a social stereotype that women really don't have ideas quite like light bulbs suddenly and brilliantly. This, there's that kind of social stereotype that exists implicitly. So there's resistance to the way in which uh, certain metaphors apply to people. So there's a general point here. We don't just resist metaphors in isolation but often do so given very specific task requirements and experiments, requiring judgments about the relevance, for example, of a specific metaphor to different people in different situations. So resistance is very much a context-dependent thing. Now, another thing about resistance, which I think is very interesting, is that there's irony in metaphor resistance. And this comes from the idea that a lot of times when you try to resist thinking about something, it actually increases the prominence of that idea in your head. And this comes from research in social psychology, which are called referring to the paradoxical effects of thought suppression. So if you're trying to forget, uh, not, you try not to smoke, and so every time you think of a cigarette, you try to resist that in some way. I'm not gonna think about it, don't think about it, don't think about it, don't think about it. And experiments show the more you do that, the more likely you're gonna think about cigarettes. The more you resist thinking about it, the more likely that is to stay in your mind. It's a completely paradoxical effect. And we do it all the time. You know, I don't want to think about my ex-girlfriend, so every time I think about my ex-girlfriend, I'm not going to think about her. And this is what we call, don't think of a pink elephant. Don't think about it. Resist it. Resist it. And you know, you think you can't help but think about it. So there's this irony involved. And for this reason, I think trying to resist the influence of some idea, like a metaphor, may actually increase the prominence in your head. There's an irony there. Moreover, resistance itself is metaphorical. Right? So psychological resistance against some idea, like psychological resistance against some metaphor that you may not like, or resist for whatever reasons, is actually physical resistance against some force acting against the body. It's a physical thing. You, you try to push it away. It's metaphorical when you say that you resist a metaphor. And for this reason, and I love this, this is something I want to send to Steve Pinker. When someone strongly argues that human thought is not primarily metaphorical, they are ironically engaged in a mental process which is exactly the thing they're trying to resist. I'm going to resist that idea. I'm going to resist metaphors. I'm going to resist. Well, you're actually doing, by that resistance, you're engaging in metaphor, the very thing you're trying to resist. So I think there's this wonderful irony there. So resisting metaphor is itself a metaphorical process. And then related to this, resisting metaphors is embodied. When I resist metaphors, again, I, I feel as if I'm reacting against this force against my body. And yesterday I showed a picture of this woman who 
uh, sometimes, this is an example of sometimes how people react to my discussions about metaphor. They're disgusted. Again, they feel as if I'm sticking rotting meat under their nose. It's very embodied when you resist certain kinds of metaphors. And the next example comes from, I, was, I met some person, this is about a month ago, and she heard that I study metaphors. And she goes, give me some interesting metaphors. And I gave her this one, which I think is from Shakespeare, Trip the Light Fantastic, which means to dance. And this is what she, I, I said this metaphor, and this is how she responded. She, she said, Ugh! that's how she, like she was going to vomit. She just hated it. And she told me, I don't even know what that means, but I don't like it. Ugh. And she viscerally acted as if she was about to throw it. So embodiment, uh, metaphor resistance can be very embodied. So, and here's again an irony. If people strongly resist your metaphors, you've actually been successful in getting them to think deeply about the very metaphors they're resisting. So I can't wait to meet that woman again and see, what do you think about the trip to light fantastic? Because I'm sure it's eating away inside of her. All right, here are some conclusions. Um, people have just begun to talk about metaphor resistance, and I'm trying in this work to really expand it and to look at it quite fully in the ways that, by different ways in which people do that. And so there's many ways in which a metaphor can be resisted. It can be resisted in terms of not liking the idea of metaphor itself. There may be specific metaphors that we resist. There's sometimes we resist metaphors quite consciously. A lot of times we resist them unconsciously without even being aware of it necessarily. We can resist metaphors totally. We can resist certain kind of metaphors only partially. We can do them individually. We can do them collectively. I think the collective thing is a big element in terms of how resistance takes place because we're in communities which have values about which metaphors are good and bad and useful and which ones aren't. So the collective notion is very important here. And in general, metaphor resistance is not something that only happens on special occasions. And this is, again, something which a few people have written about metaphor resistance say, this happens occasionally in life. We have a special thing that we do. And I want to say it happens everywhere, a lot of the times in our lives. So metaphor resistance there really is an ordinary part of metaphor use and understanding. Every time you hear a metaphor, part of your understanding may have certain implied aspects of resistance to it. There is, it's, it's part of the same thing, actually. But this has not been acknowledged in any kind of psychological theory, as far as I can tell, particularly in my own world of psycholinguistics. And therefore, we really must acknowledge, theoretically, as metaphor scholars, different forms of metaphor resistance as part of any theory of metaphorical thought, language, and understanding. And I want to give you one final example of resistance that I've engaged in over a course of many, many years. So many years ago, the great American poet, Wallace Stevens, came up with this aphorism where she says, reality is a cliche that we escape through metaphor. And there's something I love about this because there are occasions when, you know, I'm reading some poetry and I come across some metaphorical idea. I feel like I'm transcending my ordinary reality. I feel like I'm somewhere different. I'm a different person. It really does help me escape reality. So I like this. But over the years, I've come to resist this more and more because, and this is my alternative, metaphor is the reality from which there is no escape. You can resist metaphor. You think you can get outside of it, get away from it, push it aside. It's there all the way down. It's part of, fundamentally, it's who we are. And resistance is part of that. So finally, I urge you all to learn to love metaphors more by recognizing all the wonderful, complex ways we sometimes resist them. Thank you, folks.
Yeah, thank you very much for your talk. Thank you. I well, I have plenty of ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think you made a very strong case about how meta metaphors are unavoidable. And yeah, like I could also think of uh, several examples. For example, I mean, like uh, time can only be thought in terms of space. Yes. And it's there, or even in sciences. For example, uh, uh, Hans Blumenberg has a lot of works um, explaining how in scientific theories, uh, well, metaphors are part of it. Like we, we can only think of cosmos yes. uh, through metaphors. Yes. And it's, um, but I, I, once we, um, we agree the, uh, on this, um, on this basis of metaphors, how it's actually uh, impossible and and I would say Im impoverishing to try to escape metaphors. It's, it's what to escape? What's, what's, I'm sorry. In, in, is impoverishing in, where, when it's poor, more poor instead of richer. Yes. Um, like how, how do we analyze them? Because I mean, in your example, some of the metaphors uh, it's not a problem of metaphors. The problem is that some of those are controlling and some of them are liberating. Right. And so how do we choose and how do we also analyze? I, I would say that using metaphors without realizing that we're using one is what can make them controlling or... Uh, mm. Why? Let me ask you, why, why do you think that? Uh, not uh, uh, being able to to identify them. Yeah, because uh, metaphors have this generalizing aspect about them. Like we we think of holes like immigrants are skittles, so mm -hmm. all immigrants mm -hmm. are the same, mm -hmm. and uh, and sometimes uh, and they can reduce a group of people. Sure. And and sometimes we intend them well. But they have, for example, when we talk about victims or you were yes. talking about cancer, we intend them well, but they're yes. still controlling and reducing. Yes. But once we are aware of them, we can choose them properly. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to talk about how we can perhaps be aware of the metaphors we use and, and that can be very useful. But I don't think that necessarily being aware of them necessarily means you can control them and only put out the ones that are positive and you can avoid all the ones that negative because you can't tell who your audience is. And in some cases, you can tell me in the context, for example, of doing science, are we just there to put out positive metaphors or, or can negative metaphors come in? The ones that have make, give, for example, the mind is a computer that has certain elements of like, you're just a computer. You have no control over your life. You're just a machine. But maybe in part, that's how we are. The reality is that thing. So I'm, I'm not sure that necessarily being aware of it is, is, gets, away, gets away from some of those problems. But it can be useful. I, yesterday I talked about how people who have certain illnesses can become aware of the metaphors by which they think about those illnesses and sometimes embrace alternative ones that they can better deal with their illness or their bodily disorder. So yes, there can be value in becoming aware of them, but I'm not sure that we, by becoming aware of them, we're going to discipline them in, in ways so that we only end up with the good ones that aren't controlling. Maybe you can see an ongoing process? Yes, 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 yes. Thank you, um, Ray. Um, so I would like to hear when you presented the one of the experiments you had done, mm -hmm. and you had the metaphor, and then you had three entailments yes. that you considered to be necessary for yes. people to be, feel comfortable. Yes. Um, so my question addresses the the underlying issue of my question is. Um, people that think that metaphor is reducible to literal language. Right. So when you do these experiments and find like in literal language what people associate, um, how do you understand uh, 
could someone tell you, well, you're precisely showing that metaphor is reducible to some literal language um, explanation of what the mm -hmm. metaphor is? Um, and how would you, because I, I would suspect that you don't think that metaphor no. is reducible. So how, right. how would you answer to someone that thinks in this way? The, 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 so this is a relevant question to the study that I referred to, which is a complex set of studies. So I'm not telling you the whole story there, but in general, you know, metaphors convey a lot of meaning in a short, compact little statement. And that's thought to be one of their positive values. But we know and can predict, actually, in some cases, what those complex meanings are by, for example, in this case, looking at what gets mapped when you think of anger as heated fluid in the bodily container. So if you ask people to just imagine yourselves as a body with fluid in it and ask certain kind of questions, they will give you these entailments without even having anything to do with anger. So then if you just apply it to anger, people realize subconsciously that those idioms actually refer to those complex kinds of meanings. The literal paraphrase is just completely vague. It underspecifies what the meaning is. So it isn't the case that when we understand an idiom where we're just simply coming, or any kind of metaphor, we just simply are trying to recover the literal paraphrase because the literal paraphrase doesn't capture it. There's something about the metaphor itself that is what you need to understand, not just sort of push away all the metaphorical stuff and come away with a literal underlying proposition. That's not going to do it. That won't give you what metaphors are all about. Never mind aesthetically, this is where I think metaphorical performances of the whole body, are, and all metaphors are kind of whole body things in some ways. You got to look at the whole body in context because that's where the metaphoricity is, not in some little set of propositions inside your head. Does okay, so that, yeah. Yeah, let me see. So the, so you'd say it's an experimental observation that people, when they try to express what's going on with the metaphors, they report these, you have summarized them, but that doesn't mean that for you or, or that the results point to the fact that this metaphor reduces to that. So you're just saying, well, I observe that the subjects tend to associate this, this metaphor with these entailments. Yes. Um, but they don't, the, the little paraphrase. S sorry? But they do not associate those things with the literal paraphrase. Okay, yeah. And that's what the data show. They just don't, they, they can see, get very angry is relevant no matter what the context is because it's vague. And this is the kind of flip. We think metaphors are vague, but no, literal language, so-called literal language, whatever that is, that's incredibly vague. <laughs> and the metaphors have this specificity and concreteness to them that so-called literal paraphrase don't don't ever have. Okay. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks very much for you for your talk. Uh, I was I was thinking in in these metaphors about uh, people with uh, corporal disabilities, uh, and well, I, I there there's a poem from. Uh, a Mexican poet uh, named Jose Gorostiza. Uh, the, the poem is, is named Pausas, and it's about the cricket. Uh, it's about, uh, it, 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 it makes this metaphor about the, the sound of the cricket uh, and the sound of a star. And it, it is funny because, because uh, I, I once read a, a, a thread in Twitter that w where they were explaining uh, the the experiences from deaf people mm -hmm. when they could uh, recover from that and begin to hear and there were th there was like a, a, a guy that thought that the clouds made a lot of noise you know mm -hmm. and uh, and there was this other guy that that thought that the uh, actually, I thought that the, the he could hear the stars. Yeah. But it was the sound of a cricket. Yes. And yeah. and and that makes me think: uh, Is there like, uh, well, uh, uh, Jorge Luis Borges uh, tells, mm -hmm. uh, uh, speaks about the the metaphors, and and he thinks that there's only uh, a few of them, and the others are some kind of variants. But there's like this some kind of. Uh, 
objective m metaphors. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, and I was thinking, is, is there like some uh, way of, of, of telling if a metaphor is uh, arbitrary or, or natural, mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. example? That's a good question. Um, I, I would suggest that the answer to that, to that is no. There's not a good way of suggesting it. But I do think that there are certain kinds of metaphors which may be foundational from which all other metaphors may, most other metaphors may be offsprings. And this is the ones which we call primary metaphors. So things that are up or things that are more, things that are up or things that are good. Important is weight. Uh, similarity is closeness. Uh, desire is hunger. Um, those are very basic things that are positive correlations in our bodily experience. So it isn't just sort of objectively they're universal, but they're embodiedly universal to a significant degree. And the argument is a lot of other kinds of even creative metaphors are instantiations, creative instantiations of those. Um, so. Thanks a lot. Yeah. <coughs> Do you think that resistance to metaphor can be related with the cognitive bias? Because in many cases, the metaphors that you show, I think there is an intrinsic yes. cognitive bias about conceptualization of different social Absolutely. situation. And Absolutely. Absolutely. It's tightly related. And um, and as much as we want to say that those are cognitive per se, in many cases they're culturally cognitive. That is to say, they come from those those biases emerge from culture, which we embrace kind of as part of our cognition. But they're really culturally enforced um, kinds of biases. But yes, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Uh, thanks for, for your talk. Um, I was I was thinking with this last um, metaphor you are you are sharing with with us. Um, um, uh, uh, first, um, returning to the one you, you, with of, of Wallace Stevens, mm -hmm. reality is a cliche that we escape through metaphor uh, and. Mm -hmm. Then I, I I really love the 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 way you you alternative yeah exactly your your alter, alternative mm -hmm. so I was thinking if um could in some way uh, the wonderful complex ways we sometimes resist metaphors also reflect uh, the wonderful and complex ways we embrace them yes do you think that is but yes but it's it's I mean, we talk about, we were talking this morning, a bunch of us, about certain metaphors that might seem to us to be particularly apt. And what does that kind of mean? They're, they make sense to us, they seem beautiful to us, they, they're useful to us in some ways, they describe some aspect of the world, some aspect of ourselves in a nice way. Um, but I, I think the sort of the preference and the resistance go hand in hand with mm -hmm. one another, essentially. And so, uh, you know, judgments of liking a work of art also in, is, is involved with some sense of resistance to that work of art. So th I think that's true of understanding. There's certain people um, in the world of linguistic pragmatics called relevance theory, and they have this notion of epistemic vigilance. They were constantly vigilant to the epistemic value of the things that we're hearing. And we're suspicious of things that we think that violate some of those ideas in some ways. And I think that's true in general. We, we're constantly alerting to things like, we don't just go, oh, language, oh, oh, that's good, oh, that's great, that's, no, we're, 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 we're using it in an adaptive way in some, so resistance and protection of ourselves is a big part of that. It's an automatic part of it, it happens all the time. It isn't, as I said, just something that happens on special occasions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. As, you, as you were saying, relevance, what we uh, 
feel and embody relevance is is um, maybe part of the same coin resisting yes. resisting and embracing yes. uh, metaphors yes. the processes that all all this a kind of uh, resistance yes. are also reflecting the way we embrace them yes okay yes. thank you very much so i that miss what generally you know as we get older in, in academia can you can you think back of the certain metaphors that you once liked but now you resist i mean i used to be a, you know the mind is a computer guy and i think now that misses a whole lot of stuff so i have move on to other metaphors and so I, when you think about the things that you learned over time you go oh, i don't really believe that i don't i resist that more or i've embraced these new and we're constantly in, in this kind of process so uh, uh, again thank you for your um talk i really liked it and as i said yesterday i'm very very i very i i agree a lot with you uh, in the fact that we're using metaphors all the time it's you just cannot escape that yes um but something that i don't know um i was like craving a little bit more is uh well you were mentioning that we resist uh metaphors individually and within a community yeah and when you were giving your examples i think those examples were from a lot of individuals so I was thinking if you could give me an example from a community, like a community that is so coordinated to resist uh, some uh, to resist some metaphor. Because, for example, in the Skittles example, which was really good, yeah, I agree that yeah, many people will have uh, well took it that way. But I'm sure that there were other people that that was like Trump said, like, come on, it's just an analogy. <laughs> And, so, and many yeah. people says that he was advancing a certain kind of argument that makes sense given that metaphor. Yep. So it has some validity, even if other people want to resist it. But yeah. Oh uh, yeah, and um, for example, yeah. in the in the um, when you mentioned about the metaphorical me metaphors uh, metaphors about um, disabilities, yes. and you said that there are a lot of people with disabilities yes. that don't like those yes. metaphors. I agree with that, but. There are maybe people with disabilities that they, they don't see the problem. So it's I, like I agree. Mm -hmm. But I there is in this case, this mm -hmm. is a good example, a very well, a fairly well organized community of scholars and activists okay. who are very very poignant on this topic and have written a, a bunch about it and they going after conceptual metaphor theory and others for embracing this ableist notion of what the body is like and so forth. So yes, that's a community of people who are trying to you know, that resist this thing. I think that some of the earlier examples of the philosophers over time, um, there's philosophical traditions that contemporary philosophers evolve from and they still embrace some of those things, some of them. So those are traditions, those are communities of people. Um, and in psychology, my own experience, you know, there used to be, we're gonna resist the black box idea. We're gonna be computer, the mind is a computer, yeah. We're communities. We're taught that. That's okay. how we're, we're taught to hate the other idea of the black box, for example. And then when the neural network stuff started coming out, we go, no, the computer metaphor no longer works. So, yes. So this is big communities. We may individually come to believe it, but there's part of a collective there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I agree on that. Um, I, I see like these representation communities in some sense, well, in the academic world, it could be different. But I was thinking, I don't know, maybe these um, religious groups that are, how do you say that in, in English? Uh, como <coughs> sectas? Sex, sex, for example. Sex, yeah. um, maybe that's, well, that's what I'm looking for. Like, that That's really like an social niche or econo yes. ecological niche maybe where where people are that coordinated to resist uh, a metaphor yeah so i was just thinking about yeah. that and, but so if can mm -hmm. i can i tell you another example which i didn't include yeah, here and it's controversial and here's has to do with the notion that things that are good are things that are clean things that are clean are things that are white mm -hmm. so goodness is being as good is white Things that are black are bad because it's dirty. So the idea that 
good is white, bad is black, that's, that's horrible to some people, particularly if you're black. And people resist that, and they do not want you talking about that. And I have a, a friend who I won't give his name right now, but he's publishing a book on morality and metaphors. And that's a big metaphor, the, the white and black. And they, one publisher said, we will not publish this book if you talk about this topic, because it would be too offensive to people. But it's interesting that this is another case where there's some slight irony there because the people, there's been studies that show if like black Americans, they may think, you know, black is beautiful, which it is. But they will still in certain contexts see certain things that are black, like food, illnesses, disease, bodily injuries. They see that as bad. They still have the same fundamental metaphorical idea that rules part of their lives, but their consciousness about saying things that are bad, uh, black or bad, no. So it's, it's a lot of the communities, like the disability ones, there's still some contradictions between what they consciously believe versus what they sometimes okay. unconsciously, unconsciously live. Well, okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, I, I want to ask you a question sure. about, uh, well, what we were talking about, uh, before, related with the values and, mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. and how metaphors can convey values. Mm -hmm. I would say that a lot of what you say about resistance can be formulated as metaphors convey values, and and this is what is resistant. No? Mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. way as the way uh, the values conveyed mm -hmm. by the metaphors mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is what is resistant yes. or accepted. Yes. 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 Um, let me just ask you to if we can push that is it is it just the values of the metaphor that are resisted or is it the values of the metaphor producer that are resisted I, it could be both yeah. and also I, I actually i don't completely agree with what i said I mean, okay. in a sense that i think that <laughs> i do that all the time I think that, that the, i i wouldn't make such a big difference between the metaphor and the value okay I, yeah I mean, yeah. I, I guess you would agree with yes. that. Or yes, I, yes, yes. Well, in any case, that was yes. what I was pointing to. Yes. Maybe, but, but in any case, metaphors convey, if metaphors convey values, uh, often unconsciously, or we don't, right. we do not realize what values are conveyed, because yes. these values are not just ours, just of one person. Right. They, we put out a value right. through the metaphor right. uh, unconsciously. Right, and and it is in a community in Gita, right. in, where it is judged whether this right. whether this value is accepted or not, right. and then the metaphor is shaped right uh, in 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 a certain direction. Right, right, you right. Agree yeah, I agree with that. Let me ask you about those of you who do philosophy of science. Um, in terms of the metaphor resistance that you see in that work. So, um, to what extent are, are, are people, philosophers, resisting the metaphors themselves, or are they resisting the values of the metaphors? How can you, how do you, how do you, how can you distinguish, can you distinguish between those? I would say you, you cannot. Okay. I the metaphor itself versus the values of the metaphors. <laughs> yeah, I would think you sometimes you first resist the metaphors and then therefore you resist the values. Or sometimes, yes. I would say you even sometimes resist the metaphor before because you have different values. So you yes. don't really appreciate the value, yes. the, the potential be it epistemic or moral, that you don't appreciate the, the potential of the metaphor because right. you don't share the values. So, right. so you, one could say, well, yeah, that metaphor is ridiculous. It would imply that we should not be quantifying the, right. the whatever index right. we are recording, and, right. and that's ridiculous. So, right. uh, so you resist the... But yeah, I mean, I think that that would mean that my answer to your question is you're yeah, you're both doing both yeah. at the same time. Let me just ask one further view. So 
in philosophy of science do some people go, they resist metaphor as the category because in that aspect of philosophy of science, metaphor is not needed. It should not be there. But in other parts, it may be useful. Do they, people, yeah. make those distinctions? Not in my backyard, but you can do it somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A certain way of doing philosophy of science, you think that there is something like equivalent to literal language mm -hmm. that you have to aspire to mm -hmm. talk uh, mm -hmm. literal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in, to that extent, then metaphors are just so, something that might confuse or might help mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. convey some ideas, say, mm -hmm. in education, but not right. necessarily it will really right. uh, clarify ultimately right. what is the issue. No? Right. But if, uh, um, well, if, you, if we don't have this idea and think that metaphors play uh, 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 an indispensable role in, in communication, mm -hmm. uh, then th there is this possibility we were talking about that. Right. that uh, and that's related, that, that, that metaphors convey values, but not in the sense that <coughs> just are, say, conveying a value I have, but it's putting forward, it's, there is an inher inherent uh, ambiguity right. in, in metaphors, right. No? Right. Right. which right. involves a, a collectivity. Right. Right. And, and then in this collectivity, some people would accept it and some right. other people not. Right. So uh, I have to ask one other question. So in the philosophy of science, do some people are open to metaphors only as temporary devices? a scaffold for ultimately you'll eventually replace them and build them some literal thing. It used to be that. Yeah, okay. Not anymore? Okay. I mean, this started to change. Okay, interesting. Thank you. That's, yeah. That's... Yeah, so it's taking this, these ideas like my, my metaphors convey value and, and, and meaning is uh, inseparable from from value uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I think yes so um the, the way a metaphor is is, is 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 the meaning to us is is the value yes we we can give it to it yes <laughs> i mean I, let me just interrupt yeah. you we were talking about this this morning about metaphors and values and so forth. You know, there there are probably people who go, okay, here's the meaning, here's the affect, here's the value, and these can be distinguished and so forth. And I tend to be one which, yeah, it's all together. Yeah, no, <laughs> yes. totally agree. For, 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 yeah. In my opinion, um, meaning is meaningless without any value. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's good. Uh, so so yeah. Um, and, uh, and now I'm, I'm kind of uh, curious because um, I'm also a, a psychologist uh, and you, you start saying like mind is a black box, mm -hmm. mind is a computer, or now mind is a brain. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you have a, a, a metaphor of, of the mind that fits better with, with... Do I? Yeah. I got thousands of them. Because okay. I'm a, I am a promiscuous metaphor person when it comes to <laughs> trying to describe how human beings work. I think there's multiple different kinds of metaphors we can use depending upon the context and the specific aspect of human experience you're, you're talking about. Um, I mean, all of those metaphors, like the black box, the computer, and now the, the, the brain or neural networks, they illuminate some things and they are blind to others. So they, you know, they only they have a certain utility, and uh, that's why you need other metaphors to come. It's sort of like love experiences. Some metaphors work, but then you need this, and you need this, and you need this. You need lots. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so, so just yesterday, uh, the talk you, you gave mm -hmm. yesterday, we were also talking about um, this perceptual simulation. Um, in, and the relevance of perceptual simulation for, for 
like embracing some meaning and value uh, mm -hmm. and so on. So this perceptual simulation is 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 in line with the, the meta metaphor of uh, mind is in mind <coughs> is a brain. So perceptual simulation is. I a actually brain. No, I would say no. Okay. Yeah. Some people some people would argue that some people would say yes. I would say absolutely not. Because simulation is a full-bodied experience interacting with the world, imaginative. Yeah. And that's how you have to think about it. You can't say it's just a brain, it's just a simulation. So, <coughs> excuse me. There are certain kinds of simulations, like a meteorologist can simulate on his laptop a weather storm. And that's a nice simulation, but that's not the kind of simulations we do. We do a full body thing with certain part, different echoes and different feelings. It's a full body, it's a real human in the flesh thing, as opposed to other kinds of so-called computer simulations. So I, I really believe in the embodied aspect of simulation. Awesome, thank yeah. you. Yeah. You made me laugh when you said you had plenty of metaphors of of the mind, uh -huh. and that points to a promiscuity of metaphors. And I am on your side. I think that metaphors are everywhere. Yes. And basically, primary metaphors. Yes. Uh, what would be the next step? Accepting metaphors are everywhere. Uh, what would you think are the rules for metaphorical reasoning? How the rules reason for metaphorical reasoning? Yes. Uh, one would be. You mentioned it, and uh, I bring it back in. Uh, primary metaphors probably serve as the grounding force for all more complex metaphors. Yes. And what I think by metaphorical reasoning is some metaphors are very good, like I'm hungry, uh, and that would be, uh, I, I cannot, let me put it another way. When I eat and I finish eating, I say, I am full. Mm -hmm. I have a, a container mm -hmm. metaphor. Mm -hmm. And it works that way. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work the other way. When I, when I am hungry, I'm not, I, I do not say I am empty. I have a different metaphor. Yeah, all right. Yeah. I like energy. Yeah. It's sort of a metaphor in, right. and not, but it's, it's a right. different metaphor. I am expanded. Yes, yes. Right. And so how does one switch metaphors? Is there a... A sort of uh, metaphorical, let me make the analogy. As Popper said, there is a language of thought. Is there a metaphor of thought? A grammatical uh, Other way of yeah. computing <clears throat> with metaphors? Well, there's plenty of people who write computational programs that do all sorts of interesting things with metaphors in terms of learning them, solving problems with them. Mm -hmm. um, there's people who write programs that randomly generate metaphors to see how ones, which ones might be useful or apt. There's lots of different things that you can possibly say about how metaphor works computationally. Um, I, I think some of that works interesting. I, I don't think a lot of that appeals to some of the more fundamental things that I think about because again, I'm perfectly fine with the fact that there's lots of say contradictions in our use of metaphors. Like I can believe love is this, a journey, I also think love is a building, building a building. Those are contradictory in some ways, but I'm perfectly fine with those kinds of contradictions, which computational theories sometimes have difficulty accepting those contradictions because it doesn't make sense. So I, I don't know, you know, if the idea of, and people have talked about the grammar of metaphor, they usually look at it linguistically, but they're, you know, I, I don't know how to answer the question because I'm not sure. It's not, I'm not sure that's necessarily a, a profitable way to be exploring how metaphorical reasoning works. I'm not sure. What, what would be the good way to approach it? Uh, or or I, is, there, is that a, a productive way to think of, of the next steps to take in? Well, I think, first of all, metaphor. we still are at the, at the stage of trying to understand the ways, for example, the discovery that people think in embodied ways, that's still a relatively new idea. 
and to show all the ways in which we think metaphorically and how those metaphors relate to our bodily experience and how that bodily experience shapes the exact interpretations of the metaphors we use, I think there's a tremendous amount of work to be done there. So I don't know, I, I'm not, I, I guess I'm not quite sure where you're, I, you want to look to the future and see what the next thing is in terms of the study of metaphor? I'm not. If anyone wanted to get into this field, what would be the good questions to ask? Where do metaphors come from? What, you, what, what utility do they have in human life? Why do we say them? Why do we live them? Why do we enact them to the degrees that we do? What do they do for us? Actually, I think what they do is they solve adaptive problems in our lives. They convey meaning, emotion. Well, yes, and but that's simplify action. Yes, but that's <laughs> to me that's a, that they sol they're solving adaptive problems that we encounter in everyday life. And wouldn't the the critical question would be how? Sure. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And that would involve computing. That, that involve what? Computing in a different metaphor that that. It, that it also depends what with. you mean by computing. Computing, uh, <laughs> it's working, operating on certain elements to get what you want. You want to yeah, but I, again, I don't want to create a model, you create a metaphor, you create a sequence of steps. Sure. I guess I just, I'm just being difficult here, excuse me. Mm. Uh, but I, I just I don't want to think of computing in the sense of some processes working on some set of representations. And the, the old fashioned, what, what computers typically do, because I don't think that's what human beings are doing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's not all yeah. that human things yeah. are. Thank you. Sorry. <clears throat> I thought I think this last question was interesting, and um, I just want to add to the discussion. Sure. Um, yeah, it would seem that uh, metaphors, if you think of computing, or it seems to me you would be thinking of them as elements uh, that there would be some rules on or some way of knowing what roles they will play to arrive at this uh, performative success. Um, at least in some cases where, where I've studied metaphors a little bit closer, um, if you think of metaphors as frames or as perspectives, then it's not like uh, the individual metaphors could be understood as playing a role towards an end, but it would be more uh, it would be meaning generating in a way that's not atomic, which is maybe why the metaphor of computing uh, wouldn't be able to capture right. how metaphors allow us to think, if that right. made any sense. Right. Okay, thank you. I have, well, two uh, more questions. Um, one has to do with how metaphors change through time in the sense that, for example, certain metaphors uh, lose their ambiguity through time. We say scientists speak of um, wormholes. And it, it, it was a metaphor, but now it has a very precise sense. They all agree on what it means and how they can calculate it. Mm -hmm. And it's completely mathematical. There is no uh, double or triple sense mm -hmm, in, mm -hmm. in when they talk about uh, wormholes. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, you have uh, very precise terms that become metaphors, like uh, revolution. It's just one circle, right? Like, and now it's a complete, uh, it's a real metaphor in the sense that it conveys uh, different meanings, interpretations. Um, so I was wondering if you're interested in these sort of shifts and sure. if, and well and one last question just to <laughs> uh, can we talk about an abuse abuse of metaphors and in which context? Let me uh, first, if you don't mind, ask you the wormhole is that now is that still a metaphor? No, it's not a metaphor. It's a, now it's um, <laughs> a, I mean a scientific term. Uh, that they, it's um, 
Um, I mean, scientific or, terms can be metaphorical. Exactly, but 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 it's, it doesn't it doesn't um, uh, it's become a concept. I don't think it's a <coughs> metaphor anymore. It's a concept. Metaphors are concepts. Yeah, concepts but then, are metaphorical. But, but then in that case, there is no use for metaphors. I mean, it's, if everything's a metaphor, uh, well, then why do we need? I mean, I, I think it's interesting if we can distinguish between the. Their, their function and what they do to us, right? Uh, or what they well, those are both related. Let me ask you this. At what point along the development and history of wormhole, metaphor, metaphor, ah, literal? Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, I mean, first, when we have, I, I, I mean, I think uh, when uh, trying to know the unknown, they come with metaphors, but then they find instruments that help them measure, and it's just a convention. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think, uh, uh, and yeah, and I guess I, I mean I, I it's it's an example. I'm I'm not sure. Maybe sure. they do actually picture a worm in their whole, mm -hmm, in their mm -hmm, head mm -hmm. when they think, and not just measurements. Yeah, yeah. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I think you know you have to be careful in assuming that eventually you can kind of push the metaphors away and apply technology or f apply advances in science to get the real thing, the real literal thing. That doesn't always work quite that way. So I think the wormhole thing may still be a metaphorical concept. It can still be very well understood. It can be well accepted, but it can still have metaphoricity in it. Always a metaphor. That's the title of a paper I need to write. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, just to add something more to the last question. Uh, I was thinking that uh, that resistance on metaphors uh, could be uh, a form of uh, stepping into conventionalized uh, language blocks, building blocks, to continue um, uh, a kind of uh, community uh, scaffolded reasoning. So, uh, would you think that that this this kind of uh, play between resistance and novel uh, new metaphors mm -hmm. could be a subject of a technical development to manage when to stop metaphorizing when to start metaphorizing again and how to um, use metaphors uh, between uh, community i'm stuck here with the notion of stopping and starting again metaphors as if we consciously can do that i'm not sure i mean i think metaphor is always there to some degree in a lot of different domains of experience and um it's hard to step aside from it um and there may be certainly cases like for example in science where there are certain periods for certain topics where metaphors flourish and other times where there's less metaphorical flourishing um <clears throat> But I'm not sure there's an easy way you can come up with some algorithm as to what happens when. It depends on the topic. It depends on what the situation is. I think the thing is, I, I, don't, I don't think that metaphor is something that you can, okay, I will now pull the metaphor ability out of the, the top shelf of my closet and start using it, because I think it's always there. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's too, but... Uh... Once we accept the, uh, that our comprehension, our understanding is metaphorical, mm -hmm. uh, we could consciously uh, manage our metaphors in, in some sort of a way. I, I think that would be wonderful and the ideal. I don't think that can happen. I mean, I think you can man try and be conscious about your metaphors and you can argue about certain metaphors of science and which ones are beneficial and which ones are negative and which ones are, but I, I don't think that, I, I, I'm suspicious of the idea that you can sort of manage your metaphors quite consciously and that's the best way to deal with them. 
Because then again, it makes it just seem like something you can occasionally use as a tool as opposed to something that's automatically a part of what your ordinary thinking is about. I, I was thinking about this uh, physicist who, who say that they don't use metaphors. Yeah. I, I, uh, I was, uh, I had the notion that maybe they're talking about this fresh meat. Uh, yes. Uh, <coughs> and they're uh, maybe not stating or grasping uh, the, the, why the resistance is about. Yes. Uh, yes. But I think that's the, the function, the social function that limits the kind of metaphorical speaking. We, we could not go, uh, everyone talking metaphorically all, always, all the time with new, new metaphors, with new metaphors, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. because we need to, to uh, be sure that we are making the, the others uh, understand what we want to, them to understand. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there, could, there should be a limit. There, there's a limit. Uh, well, again, I think you know, sometimes we can use old metaphors, conventional ones, new novel contexts to revitalize them. That's one thing that happens. I think we do that in humans' languages a lot. Um, um, yeah, so, yeah. thank you. Uh, just uh, it, it, something adding to what you were talking. Um, I guess also the language is all, always involves metaphors sure. that are unconscious. No? Even yes. talking about, let's say, the concept of matter. No? Yes. So there is behind that there is a whole yes. uh, etymology yes. that involves metaphors. Yes. So yeah, I mean, just a pointing to the idea that you cannot. Uh, uh, you got, there is no point. There is no point in which a communication does not involve some kind of metaphorical yes. thought at some level, conscious or unconscious. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I <clears throat> I've been around psychologists who are hardcore scientists who have argued. Wait a minute! Don't introduce that idea because that's a metaphor, and we're scientists and we don't do metaphors. I mean, I, I I've heard that, and. It's, it just seems like overly artificial and too much of a phobia and resistance to the very idea of metaphors. Because again, it's the values they think of what a metaphors are, are poetry, they're emotive, they're meaningless. They're not for what we in science should, science should be doing. So that's the kind of the top-down kind of discipline of how the metaphor should be used. I, 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 I'm a little bit of an anarchist. Let it all fly and let's see what happens. <clears throat> okay, uh, one last question. Lisa. You, you have another question? <laughs> okay. It's a simple metaphor. I see your point. Yeah, I see your point. Yes, <laughs> yes thank you. And I just wanted to hear from you what I am assuming is happening that you do not agree with the idea of that metaphor like the idea that metaphors suddenly become just concepts as aurelia was kind of gesturing towards right say that say it again i, you I know don't... that the work on dead metaphors like yes. the, the idea that the metaphors have a life and yes. that they, they they kind of become concepts that yes. then are incorporated into our language as units so you wouldn't be you don't agree in general with this uh, notion do you i mean I, I, I guess I just don't understand you because oh. say, say it one more time because I just don't kind of get what you're at. So that the, this notion of dead metaphor, yes. right? <clears throat> you don't agree with that. That's what I Well, mean. let me just say, okay. there are certain metaphors that may, we may long time ago have had some understanding of which have now died. We don't know why that word means what it does. Those are true, there are some truly dead metaphors. There's certain words I could come up with and say, do you know why this means what it means? Well, actually, it's kind of a metaphor for something. There are those, yes, there are certain things which are we might think of as dead metaphors. But the classic view that idiomatic language, cliched language generally, is dead metaphor. That's mm. dead wrong. That's just completely wrong. 
And I guess you would agree, agree that there's then more of a dynamic, like maybe at, in certain uses, in certain contexts, the metaphor is kind of dead. It's not uh, really would, doing a lot of cognitive work. And then the same supposedly dead metaphor in a different context may still... Yeah, be. that's that's possible. But again, the studies that I've done is that with ordinary people in very ordinary contexts, they, they have no awareness of why certain idioms mean what they do. But if you do the right experiment, you can find that they have knowledge, underlying tacit knowledge of the embodied metaphorical underpinnings of why that phrase means what it does. So people sometimes like, I ask you to ask my students, why when you get angry, do you get pissed off? As we say in American English. And they go, I don't know. And, and then they think about it and they can come up with interpretations. But in experiments, I can show that they have a sense of internal fluid in the bodily container and being under pressure and the more pressure it comes out involuntarily so that, that you can get at what they tacitly think that they don't know that they think. And Wait. that's so when, they, when you hear something silly like cliched is like, oh, I got pissed off. There's actually some real metaphorical thinking going on there. Could, could you shuffle this last bit a little bit slower? <laughs> so you, you would ask the subject, so okay, so reflect on this. And what you observe experimentally is that the what I'm missing is a connect, how you understand the connection to the body. So they have an experience of being if you full yes. and about to explode. If you ask them specific questions about what their bodily experiences are, what happens when you have a, a body that's contained in fluid, and you ask them these questions, what happens if you uh, heat, hit, heat the fluid up? It will explode, it'll come out of the container. If it comes out of the container, does it explode intentionally, deliberately, or by accident? Oh, it just doesn't. It doesn't do it intentionally at all. Once it's out of the container, can you get it back in? Is it reversible? No, once it's out, it's out. You can't get it back in. So they'll have those very regular intuitions, very. And those reflect their tacit understandings of what motivates the idiom, like blow your stack or pissed off, that they don't even know about. So that's why, Cognitive psychology gets to these underlying things. Yeah, so they really they are really thinking of anger in yes. those terms. Okay. Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, uh, my my conclusion from from this talk is is maybe that uh, the concept of art uh, uh, maybe it imbues uh, uh, all sorts of knowledge. All sorts of fields of knowledge, you know, and the, and I would like uh, to to know what what you think about this. That art, say that. I'm sorry, say that. That it, uh, the the concept of art is not something uh, limited to to let's say uh, painting, uh, cinema, poetry, uh, but it imbues all all kinds of uh, fields of knowledge like it's, science and. It's, I I agree completely with that. It's not just fields of knowledge, but domains of experience. You know, a gesture I can give can have a certain artistic flavor to it. And metaphors have not just values, they have aesthetics to them. And those aesthetics matter to us. That's why we use them. That's why they have the effect upon us in the ways that they do. And that can be everywhere in human life. So it isn't just art is in certain domains. It's anything that having to do with human beings, I think, can be art. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you, much. Thank you all. Thank you.